Hello, I'm Zoe Ryan, the Daniel W. Dietrich II Director of the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania. And it brings me great joy to welcome you all here this evening for the opening of Ulysses Jenkins Without Your Interpretation. This exhibition, co-curated by ICA's Meg Onley, D'Angelo B. Laporte, Associate Curator, and Erin Christoval, Associate Curator at the Hammer, is the most comprehensive retrospective of the Los Angeles-based video and performance artist Ulysses Jenkins, bringing together nearly five decades of work. An innovator and beloved member of a cohort of artists who shaped the contemporary artistic landscape in Los Angeles and beyond, Ulysses Jenkins set a precedent for generations to come. From his earliest explorations into art making as a painter to his embrace of video and performance arts, Jenkins has paved a unique creative path rooted in powerful collaborations, multidisciplinary collectives, and new frameworks for media, video, and the origins of digital arts. Meg and Erin have been uncompromising in their efforts on behalf of this endeavor, and we are grateful to them for taking up the challenge of bringing Jenkins' powerful and expansive career to the fore. It has been a pleasure to watch the development of their creative partnership and deep commitment to Jenkins, which exemplifies true collaboration between artist and curator, and of course, our two institutions. The project has also benefited from the contributions of Ika Chukwu Oniwini, curatorial assistant at the Hammer. Special acknowledgement goes to Electronic Arts Intermix for generously lending the majority of Jenkins video works. We also extend our thanks to Marin Hessinger, Kerry James Marshall, Senga Nengudi, and May Sun for their contributions. And of course, heartfelt thanks always to the exceptional ICA team for bringing the show together. We gratefully acknowledge the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage for their generous support of the project, as well as Pamela J. Joyner, Alfred J. Jafuda, and Lyndon J. Barois, and Janine Sherman Barois. Funding for curatorial research has been provided by the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation. The republication of Jenkins' Doggerel Life, Stories of a Los Angeles Griot, is made possible by the Getty. Finally, we express our heartfelt thanks to Ulysses Jenkins for his commitment to this project and for entrusting his work to us. This exhibition has afforded the ICA and the Hammer the opportunity to center the full sweep of his unparalleled and inspiring output and to position it within a larger art historical context for continued and future scholarship. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And now I hand it over to Meg and Erin. Good evening and thank you, Zoe. Over the past 50 years, Ulysses Jenkins has produced an extensive body of work that foregrounds questions of race and gender as they relate to ritual history and the media. Without Your Interpretation is the first major retrospective of this influential artist's work and traces Jenkins's vibrant practice across documentary film, mural painting, performance, public access programming, music, and video art. This exhibition is on view at the ICA from September 17th through December 30th of 2021. It'll then travel to the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles where it'll open on February 6th of 2022. I'd like to reiterate our gratitude for those who have supported this project and express our deep appreciation to ICA's team that made this exhibition happen. Anthony Elms, Robert Cheney, Paul Swenbeck, Kate Abercrombie, Derek Rigby, Greg Bechet, Dustin Campbell, Scott Curry, Emily Elliott, Joy Feasley, David Harper, Adam Lovitz, Julia Polcastro, Sophie White, Aaron Bilheimer, Drew Mitchell, and Greenhouse Media. We also would like to thank the additional curatorial support that we received on this project from Mariana Fernandez, CJ Salpare, and Mara Hansen. Tonight, I'm joined by Erin Cristobal, who has co-curated this exhibition and Ulysses Jenkins. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's pretty surreal that this show is opening. <laughs> um, I think, you know, we have been 
working at this retrospective for the past three years. And over the three years, I think we've uncovered so many incredible things, um, you know, being in Ulysses studio, working with you, uncovering new video works and archival ephemera. Um, and it's just been incredible. So it's really wonderful to finally see this show and it's sort of physical formation. Um, Ulysses, you know, we thought we would just start off by asking you a few questions and, you know, helping the audience sort of walk through this show. Um, and we thought we just wanted to start off with, you know, a simple sort of origin question, which is, you know, what inspired you to become an artist? And, you know, I think something that was really interesting to the both of us is that obviously you went to undergraduate school at Southern University in Louisiana, and there you were really focusing on painting and drawing. But obviously, when you come back to Los Angeles, you go to Otis and you make this major shift in your work and you start getting into video and performance. So can you talk to us a little bit about what inspired you to become an artist and also what that shift was like for you to go from, you know, these sort of 2D based works to performance and video? Well, it's a good question uh, on a certain level. I mean, I. I got interested in what we now call art when I was very young. My father was doodling on the coffee table and I saw him doing it and I thought, Jesus, man, I wanna try that. And so I started doodling and sketching and, 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 and because back in those days, it's not like today where you got all these different programs for kids on cable TV and stuff like that. And, uh, Back when I was growing up, it was the only thing that they had for kids was the wonderful world of Disney. So when I was a kid, I used to make cutouts because we weren't necessarily economically uh, endowed. And uh, I create all these characters. I draw them and cut them out, create the uh, sort of the landscape of where I thought these characters would be. And then me and my brothers and sisters would play in those little installations that I was making. So that was the in the beginning sort of thing. But uh, of course I got interested in art. Uh, at that point, realizing that I wanted to have something to do with art. When I was in high school, I made the great discovery and I call it that because I had this instructor, I took a commercial art class. I thought that's what I wanted to do. And what I found out is that it was her chance to tell you what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And that was the premise of what was underneath being a commercial artist, being told what to do. And so I was able to discover that I didn't like being told what to do. <laughs> so, so that when I went to Southern and I got into painting and drawing because that was the only art form and this is 1964, five, six, seven, eight. Um, you know, the traditional arts is what they taught, which I found out I, I was able to commandeer, but when I tried to get into graduate school at UCLA, I got rejected because they did not, they not only did they not do uh, considering figurative painting, they also weren't considering artists of color narratives. So at that time I ran into Gary Lloyd when I was walking out with my work from, from the uh, review and he said, what you got there? And I said, okay, here, take a look. And he goes, wow you ought to go to Otis because Charles White is there. And I said, really? Because I had been studying Charles White on my own. And so that's how I ended up choosing Otis to go to grad school. Uh, and then to my delight, I will say, Betty Saar was there. And that 
turned out to be the only two African Americans, African American artists who were teaching at that level in an art school of any kind in LA, which turned out to be to my great uh, benefit later on. And of course, the themes that run through my work have a lot to do with the both of them. So as you're thinking about uh, Betty Saar, um, as well as Charles White, I mean, I'm definitely seeing, you know, questions of representation, you're constantly thinking about ideas of ritual, but before you sort of began your time at Otis, you had actually started working within video and you were working with Video Venice News as your first collective. Um, and then while you're at Santa Monica College, right before uh, transferring into Otis, you make massive images. What drew you to video as a medium to work with? Well, I was painting murals at the time in Venice on the boardwalk. And uh, of course, I didn't necessarily think that I wanted to get involved with video because uh, I thought it was going to be expensive, like independent filmmaking. And a friend of mine, Michael Singali, uh, who was also a painter, he, he hinted at me, hey, man, there's this video workshop on the boardwalk. Don't you want to go? And I thought, well, you know, I got my I got my wall to keep me warm. What am I going to do with video? And then I went to the I went so I so I went to the workshop, and that we used to call it. I got my video Jones, and I was like, you know, when you get that video Jones, you you just can't do without it. You want to just constantly work with the camera and the recording device. I mean, that was such a marvel. This is nineteen. 1972, I believe. And, uh, you know, the public did not have the ability to actually, re you know, record something. If you didn't like it, erase it. And of course, then you could present it to others immediately. So that was a marvel. And so I got a hold of the porta pack which was the device that we were using back then. And uh, just on a whole nother kind of social political notion, the Watts Festival was occurring and what was happening in the, in the regular media, they were just saying how awful it would be if you went and got engaged with the community because they were going to rob you. They were going to do all these different things and there's gangs and all this stuff. And I'd been to the Watts Festival and I said, this is a lie. The media is lying. They just don't want people to go to, 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 help, to, go to help uh, the community. So uh, that was when I came up with the idea that not only creating Video Venice News, but let's go as a, as a collective and go to Watts and videotape the festival. And that's how remnants of the Watts Festival came into being. Ulysses, I wanna just piggyback off of what Meg said and thinking about how collectivity and collaboration is so important to you and has been throughout your practice. And, you know, obviously you've participated in several collectives, starting with Video Venice News, you are part of Studio Z for a moment. Um, but I really want to talk about other visions because I feel like that was the first space that you sort of forefronted as not only a studio space, but a conceptual incubator and a place where I think your friends and importantly, artists of color could really express themselves and work through some of their projects. So can you kind of walk us through how that space came into being and what, um, what intentions you had for it? Well, Other Visions was something that actually I'd been thinking about when I was in grad school. When I was at Otis, there was like maybe six or 10 African-American students in the whole school, 19... Was it 1972? 
in particular. So uh, after prior to that, I actually I had made because I had made massive images as a project to get into Otis. I never thought that it would have this long life. It was just a project that I thought of. And because I was taking this class at, uh, this, was, this was all at Santa Monica College. And I was taking a video class with John Sturgeon. And then I took this uh, film class on black media. And I got really informed about the notions of how African-Americans were stereotyped in the media. And I realized that it also extended into the arts. Uh, you know, how many times have you seen uh, black figures portrayed, if not as slaves, but as some kind of concubine in Eurocentric art history? So I realized that at a certain point, this had to uh, this had to be an even bigger issue to address, and so that's what I that's what I when I when I applied to Otis, that's what I said I wanted to study, and uh, that was my theme for my graduate studies, which plays out into two zone transfer, and then of course just another rendering of the same old problem. Anyway, getting back to two zone transfer, that was my first opportunity to actually place the circumstance of African-American students involved in the arts at a time when we weren't being paid that much attention to, in particular when it came to video and performance. Although uh, Ed Burrell and Bodacious Bugarula existed, I had only heard of him, but I, no, no, I actually had heard of him, excuse me, I had heard of Ed Burrell when once again, on my way in the Otis, I needed to try to edit massive images. And I was looking for a place to do the editing. And I heard about LACC had a, a video studio. I go there and lo and behold, Ed Burrell is there with Bodacious Bugarula videotaping one of his programs. So, and when I saw that program, which was an offbeat uh, take on uh, the Laugh-In, a black, can you imagine a laugh, a black version of Laugh-In? I said, wow, that's an interesting issue that I should try to remember, wherein I ended up creating two-zone transfer. So that's sort of the beginning of my, video collaborative uh, activities. And at the same time, uh, the fact that I started to really get more involved in performance art. And I did that because of the studies that I was taking at Otis at that time. I mean, some of my professors, they all kind of had done performance, obviously, as you guys put in the uh, catalog my work, my studies, I should say rather, with Chris Burden. And then from Chris Burden, uh, there was Gary Lloyd. And of course, Eileen Sigalov, who I think a lot of people tend to forget about how incredible she was as a video artist. I mean, actually on a certain level, my looking at her work gave me a real interesting understanding of the notions of narrative in terms of telling a story and uh, producing that story in, into video. But at the same time, I was still in this circumstance where I was trying to project an, an understanding of how African-Americans were being abused and misused 
in the arts and in media. That's where I ended up with, it's just an, another rendering of the same old problem, which, uh, you know, it was, it was an interesting piece of work at the time. Uh, actually, I didn't realize that what I was doing had a, all kinds of even trans in, transgender uh, issues that were involved in it. I mean, a guy wearing pasties, come on. So I know that Two Zone Transfer was the project that you applied for the NEA grant that gave you the funds to kind of start up other visions. So well, we I, I had won the uh, Emerging Artist Grant that year from the NEA. And then on top of that, I got a grant from Brockman Gallery for the uh, usage of an alternative space for the live performance. The thing that's really, and I don't know if I could talk about this at all, but it was really difficult was that when I started winning these awards, all my friends started to separate themselves as if I had got a, like, it was like, it was like a, a, a fame pandemic. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, he's something now. He's not just that brother that we know of. And I found that very strange. And then to, to add to that was after I graduated from Otis getting the job at UCSD, which was unheard of in, 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 in 1979. I mean, here I was working at, was, was going to be working at a major university. And so from that point of view, that actual, that job actually helped start me to actually frame the context that eventually I would call dog world because of my associations with Alan Capro, having conversations with Capro. And then um, there was, uh, oh, okay, David Anton. And David was this amazing uh, lecturer on the structure of narrative and deconstructing narrative. He was an amazing poet. So you can start to, as I'm telling you this, you can probably, since you're familiar with my work, start to see how I would end up taking those conversations and formulating my own understanding of what I wanted to do in particular when I get to how, how you eloquently put together uh, Meg the definition of dog world. You see, when I run into that news article, my conversations with David Anton just sort of like infused with it. And I said, okay, because the thing is, just a, a little step back, when I was in grad school, the white students were trying to tell, were trying to, well, first of all, they were laughing at me when they saw my image on TV. And I said, I'm not doing anything comedic. What are you laughing about? And so then at, after that, and I, when I questioned them, they said, oh, well, you're not going nowhere with that black shit. And I said, what do you mean? You, in other words, they're implying that the, that the arts was a Eurocentric uh, construct that I had to follow if I was going to have a career. And of course, I took it upon myself to say to myself, just watch me. And, and I maybe read, they're watching you tonight, Ulysses. Well, I felt like there are so many moments that Aaron and I would read letters, rejection letters or things like that, and we'd be like, fuck them. <laughs> I'm sending that person in invite to this retro <laughs> well i'm glad you said that uh, meg but you know this is this is this is the, the this is what 
let me put, I'll just put it this way. This is what my generation was having to deal with. Totally. You know, I mean, all of us who were trying to get over and which, when, you know, which getting back to the, to the question, this is why I ended up creating other visions. The, the notion, you just don't know how glad I am that you guys put together a catalog like this because this would be my way of say, giving a thanks, thank you back to all those collaborators when you talk about my collaborations that I worked with over the years. Because primarily they're all my friends. <laughs> It's going to be an amazing uh, reunion, I think, when we actually do get the show to uh, LA at the Hammer. Because then all of them who are here in Southern California, we can all hook up again. But as you're talking about your friends, you have a lot of you know very famous friends, a lot of friends who have been making art with and alongside you. Um, a lot of them who are going to appear within this exhibition, including David Hammonds, Sangin the Beauty, Marin Hassinger, May Sun, um, among many, many others. Will you talk a little bit about, let's just say, um, your loose association with Studio Z, how you began sort of meeting and working with some of those artists? Well, first of all, I, in my association with Studio Z does start with David Hammond. So when I was painting murals in Venice, and uh, one day I came home, to find this brother sitting in my living room. And, you know, this is back in the days of that, uh, that song, Mrs. Jones. And, you know, the brother doesn't know what's going on when he's not home kind of thing. And here I see this brother sitting up there in my place and I'm going like, now who's this dude in here with my old lady? And so when I start to approach him and he goes, Hi, my name is David Hammonds. And I had to, I almost froze. <laughs> I said, David Hammonds, what's he doing in my place? Which is, if you know David, that's how he shows up. He never, he never really likes to be announced as such. He just is David Hammonds. And he, he appears in your place. It's almost like magic. But uh, I say, well, yeah, you know, he says, I've, and so then he goes, and you know, my name is David Hammonds and I've heard of you. I said, what? You know, cause I had just painted maybe my first mural on the boardwalk and I was really actually in a way it made me feel really ecstatic and proud that somebody had heard of my work and wanted, and wanted to seek me out to find out who I was. I met David that way. And then he invites me to come to his studio, which was Studio Z, which I didn't know at the time. See, the thing is, just a real side point here, with me living in Venice, I was actually an outsider to my own community back in LA. And that was something that I, I also, I incurred that because I had gone to undergraduate school at Southern in Baton Rouge. So when I come back to LA, I'm literally an outsider to my own hometown. So that eventually when I ended up moving to Venice, I virtually was a, 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 an outsider to my own community. But and to whatever degree I, I wanted to be there because I was first of all influenced as a muralist by the LA Fine Arts Squad. So anyway, I visit David Hammonds. During those visits, he would have you sit down. He'd take out a big sheet of paper, take out some drawing materials and painting materials and say, okay, let's, 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 again, just like my father did, scribble and doodle on that piece of paper. That's how we conducted conversations. Try it sometimes with somebody you know. You might find it amazing. But anyway, that's 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 how I met David, and that's what we did when when I would meet up with him at his studio. 
But then I didn't know at the time after I graduated from Otis, when I met Marin Hassinger in New York uh, at, a, at, a, at a show that I was having uh, in New York, and she told me she was from LA. And I said, wow, you know, why don't we hook up? And so she said, when I get back to LA, we'll, we'll do that. And when I was going to meet her, she invited Sangha. And that's when I met Sangha. And from that point, I found out that they both did performance. And that's when I created Adams B. Dogwood which was our first collaboration. So that was, that was the beginning actually of the notion of other visions, which when you were asking me about this thing earlier about the collaboration notions, I got that from just from, from reading the art history in the arts about all of the real big art movements that are in Western art history that had these artists who created different movements. I mean, you know, Dada, surrealism, which I was mostly also really influenced by historically, uh, those artists created their own scenes. And I wanted to do that for black artists in particular, the artists that I knew in LA that weren't getting recognized. And the thing that me and Senga and uh, Marin had going on was that uh, for a while, while we weren't being able to get exhibitions, if one of us got a show, we all got a show. And that's how we would do it. You know, I try to even, imp you know, try to exemplify that to my students when I'm teaching. What are you doing trying to do this whole thing by yourself? You need help. You need to create your own community, if nothing else, if they're not going to recognize you individually. What I was doing with other visions had the similar kind of thing Ed Burrell did with uh, Bodacious Bugarula. Okay, so you had Bodacious Bugarula, you had Studio Z, uh, you know, those were the two examples that I had, to, that I could uh, point, if I had to point to any examples of how other visions would uh, come to fruition. So uh, that's the thing that, uh, a lot of people don't uh, understand young artists in particular because I would just say this today so many young artists have so paid their allegiance to the institutions that they might have graduated from see this is the thing about I can say this about David he didn't own any allegiance to any arts institution okay and for the most part, he's, he's, he, he did a lot of the work that he was doing on, from what I could see based on his relationship with Charles White. And then after uh, reading Kelly Jones's book, evidently he had a really steady uh, common communal relationship with Betty Saar. So, you know, you, I can only say that Other Visions was an exemplar of those circumstances that I had come to know. But I also, like I said, I wanted to make Other Visions a place where you could find artists of color who needed to be uh, not only respected, but recognized. Recognition is very hard for artists of colors, even today. And the hardest part for us back in those days was to get written up about. You couldn't, it was hard to get reviews. We're doing all this brown, this groundbreaking work and nobody's writing about it. 
So that's why I turned my character for a moment as the image of truth in my birthday suit. Thank you, Ulysses. Yeah, I wanted to piggyback off of what you just said about, you know, this issue of being represented, being written about. And I think that is in part why you decided to write your manuscript and your memoir in the early 90s. That really is this beautiful account of the work that you had done leading up to that point in the artist's voice, which I think is so important. And throughout the exhibition, we pulled four major themes from that memoir. And that's kind of how you navigate the exhibition. So can you talk about what inspired you to write that and why you felt it was important to document the work that you had done in your own voice? Well, of course, first of all, the, the point that you make is that, and that I had made was that Nobody was writing about the work. And, uh, you know, if you've had a chance to have conversations with uh, Sanger and Marin, we used to have that conversation all the time, you see. And the whole notion of what also is an is a undertow or undercurrent in the, in, the, in the text of the show, multiculturalism was our opportunity to step up into the main playing field, okay? Because at a time when they started actually giving money, this is the, this, this is the thing that most people tend to forget about uh, the arts, which is the notion of how do you get paid? And I was fortunate enough to have won those NEA grants that gave me some aspect of recognition that a lot of my friends weren't able to get. And I knew and they knew that their work was worthy of being recognized. So getting back to your question, the reason why I wrote the manuscript was because I was leaving LA and I needed somehow to remember what I had done in LA, because I know when I moved to the Bay Area, that was a whole new chapter that I was about to start, which I did. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it was amazing. And, 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 and to a certain degree, that had a lot to do with, of course, that I had was an artist in resident with the state of California. And uh, that helped me actually make the move because when I got, I was an artist in resident while I was down in LA, that was, that program was so incredible. It helped you as an independent artist still get paid when you can't get a job. And, uh, and and get paid as an artist. That's see, that's that's you know, because like I, you know, in my early part of my career, I worked at the May Company as a display artist. You know, that's not paying you any real money. And of course, as you know, how I felt about commercial art, <laughs> somebody telling you what to do. So, I when I when I moved to the Bay Area, I was also able to secure an artist in, artist in residency in the Bay Area, which was very unique because during that time, they'd have these large uh, group settings that the, that the artists, that the California Arts Council had put together. That was like a meeting of all the artists who were artists in residence for the state would meet and have these large group uh, settings so that we could all meet each other and share our ideas and our work. But at the same time, what I did with the, with the, with the, with the California Arts, uh, Arts Council was I was able to get them to fund me to write 
the manuscript. And I, when, I, when I did that, I was also using the opportunity to talk about multiculturalism because I was considered a multicultural artist with the, con with the Arts Council when that, when that whole uh, theme was being produced or, or I should say presented to society as something of importance. Matter of fact, the California Arts Council took me as one of, uh, one of the representatives of the CAC to a national multicultural uh, seminar in Washington, DC, which really blew my mind to see what all of the rest of the country was doing with this premise. So that's why I decided to write my version of it for what I was doing, not only in uh, California, but with, and in, in, in terms of LA, but what other visions was about, because I know if, but, but see, I got that whole notion, back to your original point there, I got that notion about writing about my work from grad school, because what they taught us when I was in grad school in Otis, that was primarily steeped in the foundations of conceptual art was that if you didn't document your work, which you see I did well, write about your work, which I had to learn to do. I mean, that's what that whole magazine, which I think you've seen high performance was really all about. If you were a performance artist, nobody was coming out to see these obscure and out, the, out of the way uh, performances. And so high performance allowed you to not only write about it, but you could actually put document, pictorial documentation to your writing so that what, that what that magazine did was also gave you a certain kind of presence that uh, once again, the newspapers weren't coming to see this work. The art magazines, Art in America, Art Forum, they're stuck in New York primarily. So California was out of the question. And as far as that's concerned, we could have been out of this world. <laughs> as far as we should have been, we were on another planet as far as they were concerned which we did enjoy being since we all, everybody in my, in my constituency, we all love Sun Ra. Matter of fact, David Hammonds did a performance himself with Sun Ra. As I told, I, I told you about that story. One of you, I told you the story when David Hammonds took me to meet Sun Ra. I wrote about it in the catalog. Oh yes, okay, so you got it right. <laughs> Ulysses, this is fantastic. I think we're going to have one more question. Is that cool with you, Aaron? So I think maybe we'll end on asking you about without your interpretation. You have alluded to your frustrations of categorization of your practice, um, of people maybe um, misinterpreting your work, particularly early in your career. Without Your Interpretation is a central work that Aaron and I both found to be incredibly important uh, within your practice. And it is also the titular work uh, within the show. Do you want to tell us a little bit about where that piece came from, what you were thinking about? It takes up, you know, kind of a large, you know, footprint within this exhibition of all of the prep work that you did through performances. There's a lot of collaborators uh, throughout this piece, including Todd Gray, May Sun, Sanganagudi, Marin Hassinger, among many. Yeah, well, without your interpretation, had did have a lot to do with the uh, premises of uh, people not understanding. I mean, once again, back we have to go, you know, backtrack. Back in those days, people. Uh, so-called art writers, art writers were not, for that matter, very familiar with the contexts of African American culture. With, and which is, is just really hard to understand on a certain level because of all the 
really great black artists that came to four uh, before us. They had no notion of thinking. And, and, it, and what I'm pointing at is some of the stuff that Charlie used to teach us. I mean, you go to Charles White's class and you were getting a global perspective on not only the world in its context, but how people were dealt with uh, black art and the black community, which seemingly was zero in particular at that time. I mean, what I'm talking about, you see the same kind of things that are being uh, exemplify in Carrie Marshall's paintings. I mean, think about Carrie, he takes you straight in the hood. And you, there's no way you are not going to escape that community. And, and to that extent, you know, uh, sometimes younger artists, they get confused because of the notions that come out of art schools that are surrounded or you get surrounded by Eurocentric constructs so that you're copying those constructs and then you wonder why you can't go nowhere because they tell you, you you're not being you. And that's what I found out when I was in grad school and when they came at me like that. So that's why I did two zone transfer, you know, cause the underpinnings of two zone transfer is that whole notion of the, not only the stereotypes, but the whole idea or ideas that had to do with how do we view the black image? Okay. So anyway, uh, you were asking me about without your interpretation. Oh yeah, see, I stumbled back into the back there. Uh, without your interpretation came about for the, from the music. And that was the first performance that I ever sang in. Uh, I mean, I did poetry with massive images, but I met Michael Delgado when we were working at this video reproduction house. And uh, when I met him, he asked me, was I a musician? And I said, no, but I do performance art. But I, but I had told him I had come up with this little melody that I didn't know what to do with. And uh, he, uh, he said, well, let's, 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 you know, come on over and let's, 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 let's listen to it. So I worked on that, you know, and, 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 and I never was a, I, I have to admit that I was never a great guitarist, even though I play on uh, some of my musical uh, soundtracks. But uh, Michael took a, took a, took a listening into it and uh, ended up, I was teaching this class at Cal State Dominguez. Uh, I was substitute teaching for uh, Nancy Buchanan. And I, we, we played this melody with my class and I taught them the lyrics that you hear in the video. I had my class singing the lyrics and it, it got turned, it got so, so out there, man, that the other teachers had to come and tell us to shut up because we were, the sound was bleeding into their classes. But uh, that's how that performance began. But then there was the relationship with Rudy Perez's uh, workshop that he was doing at my studio that myself and Sanga and May, uh, I think uh, Okrano uh, were, were taking at my studio. And so we took those exercises that we were doing with Rudy and implanted them into the, my performance, uh, which was really interesting uh, conceptually, wherein, uh, of course, Bob Dale sitting at the, at the table with Marin uh, watching TV, that was all about 
how we watch the, we watch the news and the media and do nothing about what we're looking at. Bob Dale is a good friend of mine. I knew him from uh, grammar school. He videotaped massive images. So there's a cycle of my recycling friends in my work as well. But then of course, then there's uh, Chrono and Frank, which you guys put on that notice that you were sending out about the show coming up in uh, Philly. Uh, Frank, I got introduced to but through Sanga and Marin because he had been working with them and uh, prior to me, and he was also a member of Studio Z. Uh, and Chrono, of course, I I don't remember. I can't remember how I met if I met him through Vinsula or not. But uh, Crono was a, is, he was also a dancer and an incredible guitarist. So uh, see who else that oh and Todd of course I I don't remember how I met Todd exactly, but uh, he. Well, he was somebody after I had met him, I recognized his talent and I said, you know, he should be working with us as well. Um, let me see, anybody else that I'm forgetting? Well, of course, the band that Michael had had uh, Life in the Park. I, after, I, after I started developing this music with, with uh, Michael, I started going on hanging out with his band and uh, they started coming to my studio, which was just really a, amazing for me to have a, a full band playing something that I had created. I, I hadn't had that experience yet. And so we, uh, we developed this music that you hear as even if, if you listen to, as you probably have in that video, there's a, there's a certain section in there. This is the thing I loved about other visions where I could improvisize. And in the middle of that, I improvisized this song by Jimi Hendrix, Drifting on a Sea of Forgotten Heartbreaks. <laughs> uh, anyway. I just have one last question, which is really, um, you know, Ulysses, given that this is the first major retrospective of your work, it comes with a fully illustrated catalog and we're also republishing your memoir. Um, there's so much new scholarship, I think, that is circulating around your work and that I think that has been missing from a conversation over the past few years. And so, what are you going to take away from this show and, and sort of how would you like this show to live on in the future? Well, I hope the show does live on and uh, I have to be very thankful for what you, the work that you guys have all done. And I guess I can say this, uh, hopefully it's not uh, insulting, but at least I'm not dead. <laughs> I mean, when you say that all the stuff that is being, uh, that it's emerging around what this, this, this discovery of, of my work represents. But uh, uh, how do I want it to live on? I just hope that, uh, I, you know, you guys got so much of my writing in this catalog. I hope that uh, people have some uh, aspects of rev Rel rel relativity uh, in terms of what they read and how to formulate doggerelism. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I was always fascinated with the whole thing about Dada, like I said, and surrealism. I mean, you know, that surrealist, that surrealism uh, manifesto, it's, it's, it's so important that I don't think young people today realize because they take everything straight off the media 
and straight out of the com out of off, off computers and all they do which is hard for young people to understand you do not have to copy you may start out copying but you have to to be a mature artist you have to create your own form of art that you can put your foot down and say this is mine and it's not something that I certainly uh, have to contribute. I mean, I don't say that I didn't uh, learn from other artists. That's not what I'm trying to say. But to claim your own ism, I'll just put it that way. That's, I mean, that's what I try to teach my students. And, uh, I mean, I just had a conversation the other day with uh, Snazna Petrovich. She's the one who I got the first retro uh, at her at her JC, and uh, we had a grand old time talking about how she was telling me she was intimidated when she took my class at UCI. I said, "What?" But people had told her things about me that I didn't even know about. And, uh, you know, that's my other side of my life, which is being a professor. So uh, what can I say? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I think the one thing that people will take away from this show is um, to pave your own path. You know, yes, and that's, think... that's what I was doing. Thank you for saying that. That's that's what I was trying to get at. Uh, mm -hmm. Because to a certain degree, if you don't do that, then that's that's all you are doing is copying. Which some people yeah. they don't they don't realize when they're doing it, they're excusing themselves for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that that has been the essence of your practice over the years, really carving your own path. I mean, even within video, you know, the fact that you are doing documentary work, you're wor working in public access television, you know, you're essentially making music videos in some of your work. You have really, I think, uh, created a space to be DIY you know, to really explore all the things that video can do. And I think you see that through the show. Um, so well, let me, let me, let me, let me accent on what, what you just said. Mm -hmm. I, since I didn't really have much examples of other African-American artists doing video outside of the few I just mentioned, I was trying to explore what was the possibilities in the medium that I could think of. That's why I have this variety of genres that I was, was working in. I mean, to a certain degree, my, my greatest examples were musicians. And of course, my other great uh, invisible mentor was Miles Davis and how he moved within the music world. Between Miles and Hendrix, see, when I, when I ran into Jimi Hendrix in the 60s, I said, what is this brother? Where is he coming from? And of course, you know, his, his I thought, which people don't talk about enough, was his major song, Are You Experienced? What does that mean? Experienced of what? Of course, back in the 60s, that was about LSD. But if you took LSD, you'd know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we should just end it there. You <laughs> what a perfect place to end. Thank you so much. Um, it's been such an honor working with you on the show. And I know we're going to celebrate when you get out here. I can't wait for you to see the show and turn it up. Thank you so much. Uh, we, you know, as Meg said, this has been an honor to work on this retrospective over the past three years. And 
also I think to come full circle, I think your work has inspired both of our curatorial practices. And um, yeah, without your interpretation, we're really excited to have everyone and thank you. Well, thank you. I'm glad that title will live on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Ulysses. Thank you so much for joining us. Please click on the link in the description to join the live Q&A.